and welcome to Connect 2022. My name is Jamie Kaiser and I'm Talon's Chief Operating Officer. I want to give a warm welcome to all of our audiences around the world. Bonjour, allo, konnichiwa. I'm incredibly excited about today's conference. It's absolutely packed full of exciting product announcements and cool stories from our customers. What do you say we get things started? You're going to hear a lot today about the concept of data health, but you might ask yourself, what is data health exactly? Data health supports the outcomes you want to achieve in your business. Let me illustrate it another way. You might remember Cosmo, the chief destiny officer. Cosmo reminds us that without healthy data, your company would literally be better off with a magic eight ball, a crystal ball, or talking to the universal vibrations to figure out what to do next. What might that look like? Happy hump day. This is how we will be making all of our decisions from here on out. This data is pure. It is from the universe. Why don't we try actual data? Tina, we are in the middle of a meeting right now. Data. We'll unlock it from ourselves through the crystals. That's hilarious. I love Tina giving Cosmo real data. And that's just it, right? You want data that you can find, understand, and trust. So you can get real value out of it for your business. Today, we're gonna to be talking about some critical data use cases that we know are top of mind for you. You're gonna learn from companies big and small about how they tackle these initiatives with data. And then you're going to see how Talon products make solving these challenges simple. With product demos and illustrations of our capabilities, you're going to walk out of Connect today with real actionable blueprints on how to solve your own specific data issues. And don't forget, Talon representatives are standing by in the chat, ready and waiting to help you with any questions you have or information you need. Let's kick things off. I'd like to welcome to the stage Talon's CEO, Crystal Beamont. Hello everyone, it's so nice to be here. Last year when I spoke with you, we talked about how business would most likely never be normal again. And unfortunately, that seems to have come true, really true. What's happened in the year since we last helped connect? Well, a few things, a war, a pandemic, the great resignation, just to name a few. Look, there's a lot of debate about whether we're actually in a full recession or not. And I believe that we are, but regardless, one thing is for sure. It is certainly turbulent economic times. And when I speak to our customers, I hear about these uncertain times and how it's impacting them. Look, it's harder and harder for them to anticipate the future. Budgets are being cut back. They're requiring much more scrutiny. More visibility is needed and more predictability than ever before. But what we've learned from the last recession is that the companies that paused or eliminated their investments weren't the ones that ultimately thrived during difficult times. In fact, the companies that did the best and are the most resilient are the ones that use the recession to find efficiencies and invest in the future. In other words, now is the time to make the most strategic moves and invest in your future. Expand where you can and place good bets. And the best way you're going to be able to determine which moves are the right moves and which moves are the right moves right now is through data. But it's not just any data. It has to be data you can trust. The good news is many companies have begun the journey of automating their data, which is in fact the first step. However, most would also admit that they have quite a distance to go before they truly become a data-driven organization. In order to understand what that is, I think it's important to explore what it means to be data-driven. So let me start with a little research we conducted earlier this year. First, automating your data is one thing. You know, making it available and discoverable is an entirely different thing. So it might surprise you, because it certainly did me, that even with all the work that has been done on the data management front, 
the number of people who responded to our survey and said that they actually felt confident that they could locate data that they needed inside their own organization, it actually dropped 10 points instead of increasing over the course of the year. That's concerning. Another big takeaway from our survey was that a third of the respondents said that they still struggled with having conversations with colleagues about trusting the data and being able to leverage that which in fact makes it very difficult to get behind making bold decisions, especially at a time right now. And a staggering 97% of companies say it's still too difficult to actually drive meaningful business impact under the conditions that we currently operate with data in. I have to ask you, our data specialists, our data professionals, our data heroes, what are these gaps? What's causing your job to be so hard? And why is it so difficult to enable an organization to truly leverage data more effectively? I mean, after all, you're using, hopefully, talent, the right tools. You've built faster pipelines. You've solved really big technical challenges. In fact, you do all this amazing work. You create clean and current data and make it available to the specialists who need it. So why isn't it having a bigger impact? You're working hard and doing amazing things, but there's a disconnect between the work you're doing and the tie back to the outcomes your company is looking for. Well, that is exactly what we're here to talk about today. What is it that's keeping your work from being leveraged even more effectively than it is today? And how can we ensure that the workloads that fall on your shoulders don't continue to queue up unnecessarily? First, there are a few things we need to establish about what we here at Talon to believe to be true. In order for organizations to truly be data-driven, it means that we not only need to consider how we automate, integrate, and cleanse data, we also need to think about how every single person who requires data to do their job can be empowered to leverage it. It also means that they need to be able to actually find the data that they need to do their jobs, that they can be confident in the data. And number three, that they can maintain that confidence in their data over time, especially when, despite very few things in our world actually staying constant, data being one of those things that we know changes all the time. The combination of those three are what we call data health. Let's take a deeper look at what each of these mean. And let me also start by saying, data health is the idea that data should support the business initiatives you're working on and the results you expect. Healthy data supports the enablement of outcomes across your entire company. So how do we get to this place where data becomes the true lifeblood of your business? Let's break down the three critical ingredients. The very first one is access, ubiquitous accessibility. Everyone in your company, and I mean everyone, needs to be able to find and understand the data they need. Typically, data management begins and ends with data integration and with particular sources and destinations in mind. And this does work and is important for some of the problems that organizations face. However, this really only addresses a small subset of the use cases and a small subset of the constituents within an organization. We estimate about 10% at best, but it's a very small set of IT professionals and data specialists and a small set of those workloads. There are another 90%, we estimate, of employees that actually depend on data for their day-to-day -day jobs. And there are events that are ongoing and ever-changing that re also require data to perform those tasks. What we're seeing is a breakdown between the IT teams and the data specialists that manage every day and then the data that the business thinks they have and that they know they need. There's a gap. You might have the most fantastic up-to-date cloud infrastructure and an army of data engineers. But those great integration skills are only as good as the rest of your company knowing what data they have and having data literacy so they understand it and ultimately having governed access to it. Otherwise, and you've seen this, you end up with countless versions of the same requests for data sets to be recreated over and over from across the business. And that drains valuable resources and creates a litany of issues surrounding the single point of truth. 
ultimately, our vision is to allow everyone in a business to understand what data is available to them in a much more intuitive and user-friendly way. And listen, once you have access to that data, the second ingredient is all around universal trust. What's one of the very first things that people say when they receive a new report? I'm gonna tell you it's common across the world. Where did you get that data? We see it in our research. There's an institution-wide distrust of data, especially when it comes from another department. Why is it? Well, for one, there's no standard for measuring data. No universal metric that shows the data is actually good quality. There will come a point in time where there'll be a common language and an industry standard and what it means to have quality data. I believe that companies will not be able to report earnings, for example. They won't be able to make their data available and certainly sell it. And companies will not even be able to consume data or want to unless there is actually a guarantee that they can trust it. I believe this is not an if, it's a when. This guarantee, it comes in the form for us called the Talon Trust Score. It creates the needed comfort for everyone, both inside and outside of business, to be confident in the data they're using. So now we've covered the first two. Now the third thing you need to become truly data-driven is monitoring. We've spent all this time getting these things in place, and we're doing everything we can to enable not 10% of the organization, but 100% of the organization to actually be data-driven. Now, we found the data, we trust the data, and we're in our comfort zone. You guys are all gonna be able to relate to this. Believe me when I tell you. Because just when you least expect it, you're sitting down in front of your computer, you look at your dashboard, and then you know something doesn't look right. Something's happened, you don't know what, and you don't know for how long, but you know that the data that's on that dashboard no longer shows accurate results. That's a problem. How many times has this happened to you? I would actually say, better yet, how many times has it happened and you didn't even know it? All it takes is one job to fail. For someone to change something that gets altered in the data that challenges the integrity of that data. How is it that other than our people, which is the most important, data is the second most valuable asset we have in organizations? and we have no way to monitor the health of it? After all the work that it took to get to this point, there isn't something to persistently monitor it 24 hours a day, seven days a week? You shouldn't have to think about it. Problems should be getting identified and fixed in real time as they occur for you. The last thing you should have to worry about is a myriad of other things that could be happening to your data that could cause you to lose confidence in it. I mean, I kind of think you have enough to worry about. Should this be another one? So data-driven culture relies on data health. Data health in three simple words, accessible, trusted, and monitored. So to recap, this is a journey. We're on it with you. And it's important to build your data-driven organization on a really strong data management foundation. But that's only half of what you need to solve. Make sure when you're selecting the right partner for you that you're working with someone who's helping break down the barriers to helping you solve the entire end-to-end -end problem of data management, making data valuable to your entire organization. And last, but certainly not least, I would encourage you to ensure that the business model that you're working with, your partner with, is also matching up to your best interest. Because let me go back to where we started just a moment ago. We may not know what's in store for us tomorrow, but it's important to be working with a business partner that's working to solve the biggest problems, preventing you from becoming data-driven, and that they do so with a business model that offers as much predictability as possible. I think that's massively important. So right now, I want to give more insights from analyst Tim Crawford on how companies today are becoming truly data-driven. Tim's been an IT leader in many interesting places like Stanford University 
and now host the CIO in the Know podcast. It is my absolute great pleasure to talk with Tim today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and engage in this conversation. It's a great conversation. I know we've talked many times. This this is a, an important topic and uh, not one that is, uh, is foreign to you. I know it's a conversation you have frequently. Absolutely. And we're just going to get a chance to scratch the surface, but there's so much more yeah. to dig into. There sure is. Look, I think there are a number of topics we can hit, and if I know Tim and I, we could spend a lot of time talking about all of them. But look, there's a few that I think are really important and that really go along with our, our content today. I want to think about, and I'd love your advice on this and what you're seeing, how are enterprises thinking about making investments in data right now? There's, a, there's some uh, interesting times happening as we discuss things are turbulent. I don't know that Bad, all bad things come from difficult times. I think there's probably some interesting perspectives, but I'd really love to get your impression on what's going on and, and what your guidance and advice would be. Yeah, and I think it's a great place to start. You know, um, in turbulent times, it, it really does cause us to think differently and maybe in some ways get a little more creative and clever about how we think about problem solving. Mm -hmm. You know, there are two areas when it comes to data that enterprises are really looking at today. One is around customer engagement and experience, because let's face it, we all in our personal lives have changed in the way that we engage and interact with companies, mm -hmm. and so therefore the enterprises have to change Responding too. Responding a little bit to that, huh? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And then consequently, there's a counterpoint to that, which is the enterprise's operations, the mm. business operations. So whether it's your supply chain, whether it's your core operational components, that has to change to be able to accommodate the changing customer demand and engagement aspects. So there are two pieces to this uh, puzzle that we have to kind of work through. Uh, and I bet you it's a bit complex underneath each one of those, right? I guess, what are you seeing some of the biggest challenges in, in solving those two pieces? So let's maybe take them separately okay. because I think the problem is very different whether you're talking about the customer aspect or the business operations very good component. Point. Okay. So th on the customer side, the challenge is really understanding who your customer is. And as we've talked about mm -hmm. in past conversations, the customer is not just changing, but the customer may be a completely different customer than you're accustomed to working with in the past three five, ten, the life him. of your company. <laughs> yes. And so it's important to get not just closer to the customer and understanding what drives them, but you also have to look at that secondary component, which is what drives the decisions that customers make. So for example, if you're going to your local cafe or coffee shop and getting a cup of coffee, mm. what's driving you to do that? Well, maybe you know, it's cold outside, and so therefore I could really use a hot beverage to mm -hmm. go with that cold weather or to compensate with the cold weather. And so that's an idea of bringing secondary data into the conversation to understand decisions that your customers may make. You also have to get closer to that customer and understanding how they think, what's important to them, not just the buying habits or engaging habits, but also look at the entire value stream for your customer from the time that they first start thinking about your your company yes. before they even reach out and make that first contact all the way through to when they're in that alumni status they've left your your primary engagement and now they're a post customer but they still have influence on others that might be customers and so That's it's so interesting it's gotten a little bit more complex a little it has. bit more challenging huh it has yeah. and we're just we're just talking about the customer journey, mm -hmm. just that piece of it. When you get to the business side of things, now you're talking about not just supply chains and how do you start to move things around to be able to accommodate manufacturing if you're in that space, yes. or healthcare if you're in that space, oil and gas. All of them have to rethink how they model their business, how they operate their business to be able to accommodate that change for customers. Mm -hmm. Add to that complexity the future of work and hybrid work and how employees are engaging with the company, it's a totally different world. And so there's yeah. a lot of moving parts here. What you're saying, there are so many pieces of that that resonate with conversations I've had with customers on both sides of it. And I love the way you break it down because, you know, there are interdependencies mm -hmm. uh, for sure, but... I think there are, are two completely different lenses and, and things to think about, like you said. So what what's causing companies or, or 
CIOs. I know, in, like in your podcast, that you might speak about what, what's causing people to not be able to achieve the things that they need to, to be able to maybe basically focus on those two buckets and get the kind of data that they need. Do you see any common trends? And yeah, there are, there are a couple things, Crystal, that, that come up on a regular basis, especially with CIOs. Yeah. And as you know, CIOs are the contingent that I tend to interact with, having been one myself. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing is in understanding the customer. They haven't necessarily been as engaged, as intimate with understanding the customer firsthand. Mm -hmm. It's been delivered through a report. It's been through conversation. Yep. Now CIOs are actually engaging directly with customers to understand what their pain point is, how they're evolving, so that they can then deliver solutions and products and have the data components that come behind it to be able to support those decisions. Yeah. Likewise, on the business side of things, we have to make decisions much more quickly than we ever have. Speed is of the essence. The way we make decisions is incredibly important, and all of that is rooted in data. This whole piece coming together is incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. This complication is something relatively new for us. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, it isn't the pandemic that drove us to this point. The pandemic yeah. accelerated trends that were already starting to take place. But now we're to a point where you have to operate. Yeah, it's in this not an mode. option, right? No, it's no this is this game is, over. Yeah. This is trying to stay in die. business or yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know it's so interesting. So you and I were just talking about a conference you just were walking out of when you and I were catching up last and it was a, a whole group of CIOs, mm -hmm. of course, that were um, talking about something that I've been hearing from, you know, maybe other types of profiles like CDOs and other uh, executives across organizations about data literacy and a mm -hmm. data culture. And what made me think of that is when you said the CIOs now are having to get involved or, or need to get involved in getting closer to their customers in ways they've never had to before. And it's almost like this traversing of an organization coming and crossing over into needing to step into areas where maybe they just would read a report and that was, you know, that top level information was enough. But now what it means to actually understand data, where it's coming from and, and have a data culture and data literacy is a topic I'm hearing more and more about. And I, I have a feeling it stems from what you're describing. It absolutely does. And it really comes back to data relevancy. Mm. It's really understanding what data and, and maybe maybe I could back up uh, for a minute. It's more than just bits on a disk. Mm -hmm. Now we have to start to understand how relevant that data is and how it connects into those different value chains, whether we're talking about the customer value chain or the business operation mm -hmm. value chain. And the only way you understand that is if you truly understand either the customer or your business or yeah. the combination Ideally of the two both, together. Ideally both, right? Right, <laughs> That's right. the goal. Because they, they both come mm -hmm. together. Yeah. But the reality is that this is something where we've been able to silo and, and pick it apart yeah. in the past. Again, the game has changed. All of this has to come together. And the other piece, which I touched on just a minute ago, is it has to happen at speed. So now we're talking about being able to make very quick decisions, pinpoint accuracy at speed. And I mean, you're not making it sound any easier, Tim. I mean, these jobs are hard, right? It's they just are. that the world, and it, and it seems to be, I was mentioning earlier, that it's a very unpredictable world that we live in. You just don't know what's around the corner. So even more important, important in the sense of urgency. You mentioned a couple of industries. You talk about healthcare, and you talk, you know, I, I don't know if you mentioned financial service, but we, you know, mm -hmm. obviously we serve uh, industries and sectors around the globe. I know that there are things that are, are even more um, challenging and difficulty or that will create more difficulties in terms of regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, there's obviously federal and, and, uh, uh, and state and local regulations, but then there's also just based on what industry you serve, HIPAA and so forth. So uh, when you talk to the CIOs, just in terms of layering the complexity of how important you know, data is and quality data and timely data, how do regulations and some of these other complexities play in? Is, is this causing even more consternation in what you're seeing people are trying to do? Unfortunately, that's putting it lightly. <laughs> um, the reality I is... I mean, people are going to be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> well, I mean, to some degree, yeah. it is kind of get in and strap yeah. in because we're in for a ride. Yeah. Um, when you talk about regulatory compliance, um, you know, governance on the whole and privacy mm -hmm. around data, it 
gets really complicated really fast. Now, if you're playing within just the U.S. boundaries, yes. that's one thing. Right. So there's state legislation, whether it's CCPA here in California um, and other res uh, regulations. And these are broad ones. This yeah. isn't industry specific. That gets layered on top. But if you look at just the state ones, it's confusing enough. And there's also legislation that's currently making its way through each of the state bodies that is going to make it even more complicated pretty quick. Um, the federal government, the federal government hasn't quite gotten up to speed yet on how they're going to manage this. Now, there are kind of bits and pieces of this mm -hmm. coming out, but that's part of the reason why the states are kind of jumping in. I'm just talking about here within the U.S. Tim, I think people are maybe thinking, maybe I shouldn't have listened to this because I'm really getting more and more nervous. Well, I, I mean, to be fair, yes, it's really complicated. Yeah. But if you've at least taken the step to understand what these regulations are, yeah. how you can maintain uh, compliance, and you're managing through, as you like to talk about, trust of data as it pertains especially to privacy, yes. um, you're already halfway there. Oh. And so it's a huge step for organizations to kind of start to understand the different domains that they play in, understand the restrictions that they play in, and use that as governance models and guardrails, if you yeah. will, to make decisions around how they use the data. Yeah. Now, a lot of this, quite frankly, has more to do with the customer side of it as opposed to the business operations how so, how so? How do you see that? Well, if you look at privacy, privacy a I lot, see. you know, a lot of that has to do with how your data, how my data is used, right? And one of the things that we absolutely need to be thinking about is how we build trust in data. And I know this is, a, this is something that you talk a lot mm -hmm. about. Um, how we build trust with our customers, yes. how we build that strong relationship with our customers. We're using their data. We're using information about them. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we build that trust. And it's very hard to build it, but it's very easy to lose it. That's right. And so we yeah. have to be really sensitive to that. But I do think that on the business side of things, it's a little less complicated because that's data that isn't typically shared outside the boundaries of the organization, and you're not using it necessarily directly with customers. Maybe you are yeah. with partners and through your ecosystem. But there is a balance to be struck there. I, I agree um, with everything you're saying. I think one of the things that we see a lot of the organizations we work with, uh, and actually the, our next guest, I can't wait for you to meet him. He's, he's amazing in the things that he's done. Literally everything you're talking about, how he's built trust with his customers, the speed and the quality and the way to stay really not just in business but to stay ahead of, of business is incredible. So I can't mm -hmm. wait to introduce you in just a moment. But one of the things you just mentioned in terms of within an organization, you, know, you talked about how making decisions, not just how you make them, but the speed and being able to be decisive. I think the, the thing you just landed on there is one of the th uh, things that we see is the data literacy, like we, whether you're talking about a CIO and across the organization, but uh, we see a lot of our, our customers that are looking for help to make mm -hmm. sure that when we think about how much time goes into not just preparing the data and making it available, but then people actually effectively using it mm -hmm. and leveraging it, a lot of the challenges we see is when that data doesn't have trust or yeah. confidence behind it. And so... We do spend a lot of time making sure that the, you know, the foundation of, of what people work with data inside of an organization, first and foremost, that they can trust it, which yeah. is where I know we've talked a lot about data health and the trust score. Um, I couldn't agree more with you, though, in terms of what's happening in the world. I actually think, uh, and I don't know if you share this view, but it's, it's you know, with difficult times, with, with adversity comes opportunity, and, and it really challenges people to rise to the occasion, and it... Um, it does sometimes um, make it much more difficult and challenging, but I think that's also where, you know, you really see people rise up and, and there's some incredible things that happen, and, and it's out of that mm -hmm. comes things that maybe would never have existed. And I think, you know, I, that's the way I choose to look at it. Uh, maybe that's my yeah. own view, but... Um, no, I, t I share that same view. Yeah. And if you look back through history, yeah. it actually shares that same perspective. Some of the most interesting innovations yes. have come about during out of necessity. downturns, right, right? right? Out of wars, out of depressions. You know, you look at the innovations that came out of the Great Depression. Um, a lot of these we live with today, That's right. and those are things that we look back to. And if you look at the roots of those, they came out of times where we really had to struggle through and find 
interesting and different and creative ways you're to solve these problems. You're saying we have a chance. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. <laughs> but you know, I can't wait to introduce you to our next guest. I think you're going to love him. His name is Andrew Bates. So let's welcome him to this conversation. He's the Chief Technology Officer of Harmony. Harmony is the largest online consumer lender in the APAC region. Now, Harmony has over 50,000 customers, and they've lent over $2.1 billion in personal loans. I think you can all relate to this, but if you've ever tried to apply for a loan, a lot of times it's painful and it takes forever. The approval process, entering your financial data, processing the data, it takes a little bit of time. And like we've been talking about, the market is very volatile and it's extremely competitive. All of these things go into really what Andrew's done to bring a unique solution to his customers. Andrew Bates wanted the data to make the process not only faster, but much more personalized. And it's exactly mm -hmm. what you were talking about. He really was looking at it as a way to be competitive and to personalize and to make sure that he could think about going beyond just knowing who the customer is, but really knowing who they are alongside the things that he did with talent. He also put together a really nimble data infrastructure. And that not only made managing data easier, but it helped democratize data and put it in the hands of every person in the company, which is important, just like you're saying. It's not just about one type of data or one person. Absolutely. Everyone. So, Tim, without further ado, welcome to the show, Andrew. We are so excited to have you here. How Thank are you very much for that kind introduction. <laughs> well, it's well-deserved, and I, you know, I can't think of anything but just um, Tim and Andrew. I don't know if you've met before, CIO. Great to Podcast meet you. in the know, yeah. Mm -hmm. COI in the know. I want to make sure that um, you can just tell us your story. Tell us a little bit about what you've done because it's so it's so fascinating, and I think it's going to make for a good conversation. Yeah, sure. So, you know, very traditional um, start for for a startup seven years ago. Uh, limited limited time and limited budget, um, but very traditional in terms of uh, how we look at our customers is. You know, provide a, a way of entering data um, and taking them through an approval process that was very traditional, mm. uh, using a, a scorecard that was based on how um, st the definition of stability that the banks have used for years. You know, are you married? Have you lived in the same house? Have you been in the same job? So very, very traditional. But over the years, we've been able to get a bit clearer with data, making better use of our data. And so not only do we now ask our customers um, some information, we actually provide insight back to them from the data, data feeds they provide us. So rather than asking somebody how much their income is, we can actually you know, present it back to them, uh, looking at the data from a, a longitudinal point of view. So over a, a, a time series, uh, over a 90 day or a hundred, you know, 365 day time series of, of the different incomes they've had and be able to actually pick up and detect their, their income over time. And so being able to present that back to them so that they can actually get a, a feel that we actually understand them, um, that they can they can verify it, they can validate it, they can check it, um, and, and correct it if we do get it wrong uh, on the odd occasion. But moving from that you know, very traditional scoring model to a behavioral scoring model, one that's actually picking up on, on the, the way they use the uh, the traditional banking environment. They're using their ATM cards a lot. So they've got lots of fixed term uh, expenses and commitments. Um, how much discretionary income do they, um, or, or expenses do they have? So very much looking at the detail of what our, you know, how our customers behave as opposed to those things that, you know, by and large were the way that banks have done it for hundreds of years mm -hmm. um, and looking at it a different way. I told you, right? This is yeah. exactly in the wheelhouse of what you've been talking about. It's incredible. It's absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's all about understanding your customer and not just the basics of your customer, but understanding your customer in depth and the things that drive your customer to make certain decisions. It's, you know what I think, Andrew? I think it's going to be hard to compete against uh, what you're doing at Harmony. And I think it's, um, it's good for your business, but it's also great for the customer because if um, you're on the other side of that experience, it's a totally different experience than the one they're used to, I would imagine. Uh, and so I, I think that that kind of, uh, that's the kind of stay in front of, right? These, this is the rising to the occasion type of situation Absolutely. that we've just talked about. But I think the, the other thing that, that we're hearing from Andrew is it's differentiating his business yes. too, right? Which is incredibly important in a competitive market. You have to really find ways to separate yourself from your competition. And I think what you're doing here is a great example of that. 
I would love to know if you can quantify it or, or give some context. Like we, we always talk about wanting to be tied to, you know, certainly efficiencies. That's really important. But really being tied to allowing organizations to have, you know, meaningful outcomes that really change the trajectory of their business. In, in the things that you've done so far through this new kind of re-envisioned, much more holistic getting to know your customer, what kind of impact has it had on your business? Uh, so I think from our perspective, we, we have two major use cases um, that we look at. You know, very traditional way of actually moving data around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, batch orientated, dealing with, um, you know, with, with financial organizations that haven't moved very far and still use you know, file-based transfer protocols. Mm -hmm. And so being able to give our engineering teams a, a tool that actually allows them to, to slice and dice to, to, to produce complex file structures, um, but then also wrap around it the support and management of tools that make sure that we get alerting right if the process doesn't work, retry logic, um, uh, escalation, uh, that sort of thing. So we are to deal with those very traditional ETL kind of processes. Um, to more complex scenarios, we were using real-time API calls, um, and those API calls are, are creating uh, data sets that are, that are streamed in real time to them. Um, so we're using things like Kafka to be able to stream uh, complex credit files and bank statement data um, through uh, a, a Talend based ecosystem to be able to uh, deliver insight back up to a, a via an API in real time. And so that kind of model means that we, um, you know, we can actually drive uh, insight really quickly. Uh, we can test and learn. We can get the, uh, we can try different things and actually uh, use the infrastructure that we've got to be quite nimble um, to be able to look at data in different ways, to be able to serve it up to just different customers. So two, two quite different use cases for us, the very traditional ETL kind of tools and, and a more, uh, you know, more useful, more real-time data, data insight uh, and data building um, insight into, uh, from data streaming real-time platforms. Hmm. I wonder if that's, is that driven more business for you? Do you believe just in terms of that timely kind of, you talked about decision making, right? And how right. important the ability to, I can't imagine how hard it is to make a decision on like a, who qualifies and how you, how you determine who qualifies for a personal loan, especially if you're starting to look at these, a lot of different variables, but it, that's not going to be possible if you can't do that in a, in a timely way. So I've got to imagine right. speed is really well, important here. Well, not just that, but how the customers are actually applying for the loans, yes. you know, that whole process. Yeah. You know, we've gone from a paper form. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that, that your institution was using in the past, but, you know, if you go back a few years, we were going from paper forms to now people are doing it on their mobile device. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have that engagement mm -hmm. in real time with your customer yep. in a different way. Is it causing you to have a different customer profile too, Andrew? Because that was something you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. Tim. We kind of have new customers, I, I guess, and, and they're evolving over time. Well, absolutely, and a really important part. Um, the way people act today is going to be completely different to the way they act mm -hmm. in five years' time, mm -hmm. or five minutes. And so, you know, real real time access to data streams is, is really important. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we provide instant feedback to our customers um, around that process. So it's no longer good enough to be able to ask a question you know, um, you know, how much income do you do you make? And then leave them for uh, a couple of days to go back and while you verify it against bank statements or pay slips or anything like that. We give our customers real side, real time insight into that data and actually validate it as they go through the journey. Uh, but then moving towards a world where actually we know that the customers had a pay rise over over the time horizon, uh, and so that might give us insight into you know the the job's going well, um, you know they're, they're covering the expenses, they've got some more capacity. And so getting to know our customers, not only at the point in time they apply for a loan, but actually the point in time of where they are in their life journey and how that's changing over time is really important. And so that longitudinal study, that time series of data is really important to our business and, and where we see ourselves going forward. You know, and this is a really good example that Andrew's sharing around speed and mm -hmm. how I was talking about speed earlier, because as that customer comes in and applies for that loan, they want the answer now. Yeah. Not or they may tomorrow, be gone, not right? A week. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that it's just as easy to say, you know what, I'm not getting the answer I need. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the competition. I'm yeah. going to go to a different solution yeah. for that, that loan. I think there's two things that really struck me when, when I heard about the story. First of all, I'll just say how, um, how proud I am that you're our customer and that you're doing things like this. It it's really is part of... Um, what fuels us to, to um, try to be a good partner to you and, and to keep striving to help you more, but, you, but you're incredible. And so I want to thank you for all the, the great examples you're setting in the industry, and, and I really mean that. The other thing I thought about is how, you know, they're uh, just 
how people, um, you know, maybe want to be viewed as more than just a, a single number or a single set of variables. And the fact that the experience, not just that we have as being your partner, but what it must be like being your customer um, is completely different than what it must be like other places. So you're really setting a high bar. And so I just wanted to commend you for that and, and thank you. Has it been, um, we talked about you in democratizing data across an organization, mm -hmm. right? And you, I was going <laughs> to yeah. mention that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's something you know, that Andrew is doing here is in bringing those insights to a larger portion yeah. of the organization. So rather than just say, okay, well, Crystal does this function or Andrew does this function and we give them a very specific report, how do you start to make that available so we can start to get more creative yes. about thinking about new ways to engage with customers, new ways to provide value, and even new potential business totally. uh, revenue streams? Uh, uh opportunities and I think just in speaking with some of the things that you've kind of commingled I know you use talent and snowflake together um, in some of the things that you're doing and um, is there anything to just on that front that you would speak to in terms of you know the, the different benefits for you inside your organization or, or if that extends elsewhere uh, I think for us you know having, having tools like uh, snowflake and Kafka means that the data is available to customers mm -hmm. it's, it's a, and, a, and, a, and a user um, uh, internal user customers, mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that they've got the tools and access to be able to get to that data and slice and dice it, yep. uh, you know, to get that insight, to be able, you know, so to, to democratize uh, is, is really important. So, you know, teams at Harmony are running things like data dojos. They're, they're, they're showing people how to interact with that data, what it means, what the data sets are, um, what's the data catalog look like, mm -hmm. and be able to actually articulate where the insight, um, uh, you know, where they can go looking for it, you know, help them through the process, but also give them the tools that they can go and look for themselves. So it's a really important part of, of, of uh, the Harmony environment is, is making sure that we can um, get that uh, data at the time that customers need it or the time that our internal staff need it to be able to look at insight, whether it's people converting through our funnel, whether it's our scorecard performance, um, our propensity to, to, for customers to turn away from us, or perhaps even into the collections processes. That sure yeah. sounds, <laughs> it sounds mean, familiar, huh? It's great. <laughs> and the other thing that I think is really interesting is let's look at the industry that, that Andrew's playing in. He's in an incredibly regulated yes. industry. And so you'd look at that and say, well, you must be incredibly constrained in what you can do. But yet, you're finding ways to use newer technologies to be able to provide greater services both to your customers and also internally to the organization. And so I think that's a great example that we should 100%. definitely not pass over. It kind of goes to the, you know, we, what you can make out of a situation. And I mm -hmm. certainly know that you're, you're up against um, your fair share of challenges, but yet look at what the outcomes have been. I think, you know, just maybe in the last couple minutes, Andrew, um, is there anything that you would, you know, just know our audience are really going to be people that are probably, you know, maybe in very similar situations to yours and maybe their, their conditions are slightly different. But anything you would offer in terms of advice, you know, trusted data, Data, speed of data, or any of the infrastructure. Uh, just would love to hear from you as any recommendations. For us, it's changing. It's, mm -hmm. it's looking at the world and actually going, you know, being flexible, um, looking at the, the data we have available today. Can we validate that this looks correct based on the customer's expected expenditure, based on their, um, their demographic data? You know, be able to cross check data across different data sets. Um, you know, maybe looking at census data and actually going, for this person living in this particular area, you know, is this income or expense look reasonable? And, and so we are a heavily regulated industry, and so we, we have multiple cross-checks with the, you know, looking at what the customer's telling us, you know, what can we see in terms of evidence-based approach, what can our, our, our models tell us, what can they predict about what the, the customer should be at, um, doing this sort of thing, uh, at the sort of age uh, that they are or, or this uh, situation that they're in, and actually go and check those sort of things. You know, we're using ratio kind of analysis to see that, you know, income versus expenses, does that, does that look right, rent to income kind of ratios? just to make sure that actually what the customer is telling us, what the data we've got, does it look reasonable, does it look sensible, or does it look like something's out of balance? So for us, it's, it's test, it's learn, um, it, it, having the tools available to, to allow us to do that quickly and easily and, and safely uh, is really important to us to be able to enable that sort of nimble um, attitude to be able to try different things. Um, you know, things don't work. Um, you know, we're doing it in a way that's safe, but we're not actually exposing our customers to harm no. or ourselves to regulatory risk. I bet you I can say this for a fact. If you didn't have data that you trusted or it wasn't healthy, you probably wouldn't be able to do all those things that you're doing, which I know is core to uh, making sure that you can move fast and uh, stay competitive. Didn't Absolutely. I tell you? 
Uh, incredible. And the thing, one of the things I was just going to highlight that, that Andrew mentioned is we were talking earlier about yeah. how you go beyond the basic data. It's more than just income and expenses, yes. but as Andrew mentioned, we're looking at demographics in that region. Does that make sense? Another example of how companies are really thinking ahead and bringing in extra data, yes. third-party data into the mix to provide a more holistic view. So when Tim Crawford goes to apply for that loan, they, A, already know Tim Crawford's coming. B, know everything about Tim Crawford and can make a decision. That's what I, I'm saying. I think that's where we're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I cannot thank you enough, um, not only for being here, but like I said, for being uh, a customer that really makes us proud. And um, thank you for uh, spending your time with us. Tim, such a pleasure to have you and to have uh, this conversation. Thank it's you. a very important one, and you've always been so great to us. So thank you very much. I thank really appreciate it. Thank you for having it. me, and Andrew, great to meet you as well. All right, take thank care, Andrew. Much.